Welcome to the second series of the Full Fact Podcast, where we tackle bad information one fact at a time. I'm Alexis Conran, and over the next 10 weeks, we'll be looking at different facets of misinformation with world-leading experts. Up first, we discuss deep fakes, a fast-developing technology that uses artificial intelligence to synthesize someone's likeness onto another person. Now, before we welcome our first guest, I'm joined by the Full Fact editor, Tom Phillips. Tom, deep fakes, full fact. How many have you actually come across in the wild? So the number of deep fakes that we've come across in the wild as part of our fact-checking work is zero. Right. Deep fakes are very much in the territory of this is a theoretical future possibility. Like, we know the technology has been rapidly advancing for several years, but at the current stage, they aren't really being used very much in misinformation and disinformation yet. This is partly maybe because it's just easier and cheaper to do other things. For example, there's been what's often described as cheap fakes, and I think we'll be talking about that a bit more later. But, you know, there are really simple editing tricks like cutting out context, slowing something down, tweaking it, Mm. which can do other things. And that's you don't need AI to do that. But yes, we've seen that the technology is advancing, but so far it's not really come into our day to day work yet. Do you feel that you are prepped for deep fakes and whether they're going to be video or perhaps even audio? I know we're going to be discussing audio deep fakes uh, later down the line. I mean, is it is it something that you need to prep as full fact, to prep your team for spotting, to to prep the techniques that you're going to have to use to verify whether a video is genuine or not? Yeah, this is something that we're looking into right now is to the extent to which we need to start doing that, Um, both in terms of spotting the possibility in the first place, but also then actually proving that something is a deep fake, which can be very difficult. It's not like, for example, in image manipulation, you know, we've had Photoshop for a long time. It can sometimes be hard to prove that something is definitively photoshopped. The way that you do that is you go and find the original image and go like, oh, well, it didn't have that thing in or it's these two images have been blended together. There are other things you can do in sort of the forensic side with images that kind of give you a sense that something might have been altered, but they're not entirely definitive. And the issue with deepfakes is because they're often generated entirely it can be a lot harder without access to the inputs to that to necessarily prove that something is a deep fake so there's two sides of it one is what tips you off what helps you spot it what gives you that wait a second that's a deep fake i mean currently you can kind most of them you can kind of tell because like the mm. mouths are still not quite moving right and things like that but it's that question there's a gap between like raising your suspicions that something might be a deep fake and then actually demonstrating conclusively that it is do you worry that actually just the thought that deep fakes are out there is enough to cause bigger problems problems such as uh, the fact that people can just deny anything and just say well that's a deep fake i i I choose not to believe it so all of a sudden we've got genuine videos Mm. or genuine bits of audio that people now have a legitimate reason to say well i choose not to believe this information it must be a deep fake Exactly. And we've heard an awful lot of talk in recent years about deep fakes. And there is that risk that's kind of associated with them, is that if people believe that deep fake technology is actually in advance of where it is and that it's actually being used widely right now, then they may dismiss genuine video. And so, yes, there is a risk that people will actually take this as an excuse, as you say, to just dismiss evidence that goes against them, that rather than the biggest risk being that people believe fake video is they stop believing real video. Oh, of course. But uh, interesting times ahead. Well, look, let's uh, let's get our first guest up. First, we're joined by a world-leading expert, Dr. Hani Farid, who joins us from the University of Berkeley in California. Uh, Professor, thanks for giving us your time. Is there an all-encompassing description of a deep fake? There is not, in fact. Um, It's really a very, very broad term that encompasses everything from audio to image to video. And even within that, different categories of fake content. So the, the broadest definition is that this is manipulated content 
but that it's manipulated explicitly by an underlying computer system. So that is, you take as much as possible the human out of the loop. So it's not a Hollywood studio manipulating a video for days, weeks, months, but it's an artificial intelligence system that has learned how to manipulate audio, image, or video. So the core of it is not manipulated media, it's the automation of manipulated media. But do we know how they began? Was it Hollywood Studios that first put them together to replace an actor that sadly has yeah. passed away, but they need to finish yeah. a film? Yeah, so the first use was not nefarious. Um, in fact, it came from the academic uh, community, my, my community. So people in computer graphics, computer vision, machine learning, artificial intelligence have for decades developed technology that eventually, as you just said, was transferred over to the Hollywood studios to automate and improve special effects. And this was one of them. This was essentially an academic paper that said, hey, look, we can replace one face with another face in a video fully automatically. We can train a system to do that. And it didn't, you know, because the internet is what the internet uh, is, didn't take long for somebody, in fact, with a handle called Deepfake on Reddit, to take that technology and create non-consensual pornography. They took one woman's likeness and put it into an sexually explicit material, and then we were off to the races. So this is why we can't have nice things anymore, uh, is because people misuse technologies. Um, but the first, perp the first uses, and in fact, many of the papers that have come after that, or not for nefarious purposes. The primary application is Hollywood studios and special effects. But of course, you can immediately see the negative impacts from non-consensual pornography to visual misinformation. And that's the things that keep me up at night. Would the average person today, would they have come across a deep fake video? Are they as prevalent as we are being made to believe? I think probably the average person has seen it, but not in a way that was intended to fool them. So many, many people have seen the Nick Cage inserted into the Sound of Music or the Saturday Night Live skits or the comedic uses of deep fakes because they're funny and they're very effective. I think the average person pr probably has not seen a nefarious use, however, the most prevalent use of deep fakes today is in the space of non-consensual pornography. Primarily women's likenesses being inserted into sexually explicit content. And that has a huge following online. So if you are somebody who spends a lot of time on porn sites, um, you will have almost certainly come across these types of deep fake videos where people are using them to co-opt other people's likenesses. We have not seen prevalent use of these technologies yet in the misinformation space, whether it be political, economic, or social. But many of us believe that that is probably just a matter of time. And how easy is it to make a deep fake video? This is in some ways what I find most interesting and worrying about deep fakes is that it is getting easier and easier and easier to create these. So for example, you can today navigate to the website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, and it's a site that will just generate images of people who don't exist using deep fake AI synthesis technology. And then you can take one of those images and create a fake profile. In fact, we've seen that. We've seen it on LinkedIn. We've seen it on Twitter. We've seen it on Facebook. And that, there is zero barrier to entry. You literally navigate to the web page, pluck an image out, and use it. Zero barrier. Now, with audio, there is a larger barrier, um, but it's being reduced every day. Um, the technologies are getting better. They're getting more accessible. And now what you're starting to see are websites and apps popping up that just do it for you. So you know what the trend is with technology. So what's the trend? Every 18 months, the technology gets cheaper, faster, and better. And this technology falls in exactly that category. So while different types of deep fakes require different levels of skill today, that barrier day after day, week after week continues to be reduced. And eventually it will be democratized to just about everybody. And now you have to ask yourself, what does the world look like when just about anybody can create a fake video, audio, or image of a person saying or doing just about anything. How do we have trust in the information that we consume online every single day? And that's a tough question to answer in part because of this technology. 
So if I wanted to create a deep fake video of somebody I knew, what would I actually need? Would I not need a whole bunch of video of them speaking, different angles of their face, or are still images enough for AI to work out the rest? Right, so this is a great question. What do you need? I wanna create a, a deep fake video of you superimposed on somebody else, and what do I need? And the answer to that is, it depends. It depends if you're making a lip sync deep fake, a face swap deep fake, or a puppet master deep fake. So for example, for a puppet master deep fake, I only need a single image of you. That's it. And then I need somebody to act out what I want you to do. Yeah. And, and then I just need some technology to run that. Right. You're essentially going to put my face as a mask onto someone else's face and use the movement of their face, but with my face covering it. Exactly. And I need a single image of you. Now for a face swap deep fake, slightly different technology where I take a video of somebody saying and doing something and I replace only their face. I need lots of images of you to do that. Maybe hundreds, thousands. Now for a lip sync deep fake where I only replace the mouth of somebody speaking. So imagine I take an interview of you where I can see you and um, I have a new audio track and now I just have to synthesize your mouth. So for that, you know, I need about maybe an hour of video of you to see what your mouth looks like in different positions. But what the trend we've been seeing is that the amount of data and the amount of computing power that we need to create deep fakes continually is being reduced because the underlying algorithms are getting smarter and better and more efficient. But I will say that there is not a huge barrier to entry and certainly for world leaders, CEOs, actors and actresses who have a big online digital footprint, we have far more data than we need to create deep fakes of just about anybody right now. Average citizen, it's getting dangerous, but it's probably you have a little bit of protection because you don't have as large of a digital footprint. And I can imagine when it comes to deep fake audio, which is something that mm. I have come across in scams, which is the world that yeah. I sort right. of talk about. The scam was quite simple. It was a sort of a CEO fraud, a middle ranking accountant received a phone call from what she thought was her CEO. She had a perfectly reasonable conversation with him on the phone. He was urging her to make payment to a new client. It was the last day of the quarter and that payment had to go through that to that day. It was an enormous amount of money, but mm -hmm. he convinced her on the phone and then she went and convinced her colleague that she did really speak to the CEO. It turned out to be a deep fake audio and from what I've understood is that the voice of the CEO they only needed about 20 minutes to half an hour of audio yeah. just audio yeah. to synthesize yeah. his voice so deep fake audio is even easier than the video part yeah in some way it is because obviously you don't have the complexity of facial expressions and head movements you just got to get the sound right and if we were having this conversation say two years ago you probably needed hours and hours of audio. So the first really, really good deep fake audio was of Joe Rogan. He was relatively easy to, to synthesize because they literally have hundreds of hours of him talking. They have a huge sample set. And what has happened, as I said, is that the amount of data you need keeps going down. So somebody like you has a huge vulnerability because your voice is, we have lots of time. Or just if I do an interview for 20 minutes, somebody has my voice for 20 minutes and that technology to synthesize my voice is getting better and better every day. And that, you know, you can see where this starts to get very disconcerting. Like now it's not just, oh, I navigate to a website and I see something, how do I trust it? I'm literally getting a phone call. How do I trust that the person at the other end is who I think it is? And that is starting to get into a very weird dystopian future. Um, and I think that does concern a lot of us quite a bit. Five, 10 years ago, we had Photoshop where all of a sudden we could manipulate photographs. We could take someone out, paint the background in, we could put somebody completely different in. Why are deep fakes any different mm -hmm. to what yeah. we could do with manipulating photos? Right. So a couple of things about deep fakes that I think are, while not um, fundamentally different than the Photoshop world, I think is a different landscape. So first of all, it's not just images now, it's video and audio. And you and I both know that video and audio have a big impact when people see it. That trust of I'm looking at this with my own eyes is significant, number one. But number two, and more importantly, is that with Photoshop, you still needed to be able to use Photoshop. And while that 
of course, because the software has gotten better and better and more automated, still required some skill. But that's not what we're talking about with deep fakes. We're not talking about sitting in front of a piece of software that is fairly complicated and learning how to use it and being highly skilled at it. We're talking about literally grabbing a bunch of images of somebody and using an automated algorithm to synthesize it. So, you know, you could say, look, I could take this one step further and say, well, look, Hollywood studios have for decades been creating special effects. Sure. But that's not a global threat because you and I are not Hollywood studios. We don't have that type of skill, time and money. Mm. And while Photoshop is not obviously a Hollywood studio, it was a barrier to entry. And we keep reducing that barrier to entry. And that not so much the fact that you can manipulate content, but it's that democratization of access to Hollywood style video, audio and image editing. That is the underlying threat here. Okay, so let's talk about the effect. Misinformation, disinformation has been around for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. we've, we've done a lot about this on, on podcasts. It's not a new thing, even though we are led to believe that this is, this is suddenly a new trend. What is the impact of deepfakes, videos and audios? What are we mm -hmm. worried that it might do to our society and to our democracy? So let's talk about misinformation. So of course you're right, it is not new. Um, as long as we have had information, we have had misinformation. But what is new here is not that the, the idea of misinformation or the weaponization of misinformation, it is social media. It is a network like Facebook with 2.7 billion users around the world that allows you now to take misinformation, disinformation, and broadcast it to the world instantaneously. And that is new. And what's really new, and in some ways, really the problem here, it's not just that you can broadcast, but then you have the Facebooks of the world, the YouTubes of the world, the Twitters of the world, and the TikToks of the world, amplifying that through their recommendation algorithms. So what you have to understand about social media is what they are prioritizing is engagement on their platform. The longer they keep you on their platform, the more money they make. Well, how do they do that? They feed you content that engages you. And what those algorithms have figured out is salacious, outrageous, conspiratorial, divisive and hateful content keeps people on the platforms. Now, we should talk about why that is. That is a human problem. But the algorithms have learned that. And so what they do is they propagate that misinformation. They prioritize it over trusted information because it's more engaging. The outrageous article people are more likely to click on. And so the algorithms have learned, let's do that. So that's what's new in the landscape. It's, it's not really the misinformation per se, it's the delivery mechanism. And then of course, we have a highly polarized population now in part because of social media, which has created echo chambers where we keep reinforcing people's preconceived ideas because we keep feeding them things that conform to their worldview. And that to me is the, the real threat here is that it's not so much the misinformation, it's the delivery mechanism. Now, what role does deep fakes play into here? And here, I think it's fair to say is that it's somewhat incremental because sure, I can create fake news stories all day long, but now I'm gonna pair those with an image and a video and an audio of a candidate saying and doing something. And that is like throwing gasoline onto an already burning fire. You are simply amplifying the power of that misinformation because visual content is very powerful, at least viscerally so. Now, I would argue that the bigger threat here around this just polluting of the online information ecosystem is the so-called liar's dividend that once you enter a world where every news article, every audio, every image, every video can be manipulated, well, nothing has to be true. Everybody has plausible deniability to say, well, it was fake. And look, without being partisan or political about it, we have a president here in the United States who on a routine basis demonizes the press, calls out actual factual information as fake because it's inconvenient and it works because people have stopped trusting information because it's unreliable. And that I would argue is the larger threat here of what deep fakes are doing. We are going into a world where we simply can't trust anything because everything can be fake. And now everybody has their own set of facts. And I don't think you can have a society or democracy where we can't agree on basic facts of what happened and what didn't happen. If we become better at getting a correction out quickly mm -hmm. enough, 
Is that a solution to our problems or has the damage been done already? That's a great question. And I have to say, this is something that really keeps me up at night because we dedicate a lot of our resources here um, to developing technology to detect manipulated content, whether that's images, video or audio. And one of the things that I worry about is that even if we are incredibly successful and very, very good at what we do, it may not be enough because you and I both know that the half life of a social media post is measured in hours. So 50% of views happen within a few hours of a, of a tweet, um, of a Facebook post, et cetera, et cetera. And what that means is that correcting the record is incredibly difficult. And we also know that um, correcting the record doesn't always work. Um, that when you try to set the record straight, it often there's a boomerang effect um, where people sort of remember that there's a controversy but don't remember what it is because we're moving so fast online and we're seeing hundreds, thousands of posts online. And so the real nightmare situation is the fake video comes out 40 hours before the election. We correct the record 40 hours before the election, but it doesn't matter because during that eight hours, hundreds of thousands of people have seen it. They either never see the correction or they see the correction and think, well, I don't really know, but something is wrong here. And that's the game because I'll remind people that in 2016, the difference between a Trump and a Clinton presidency was 80,000 votes in three states. The margins are incredibly thin. And so that's why this misinformation campaigns are so effective is you don't have to move millions and tens of millions of people. So I do worry about this. I worry about, can we set the record straight? And I think, you know, without the help of the social media companies, we cannot, because if they keep allowing this information on their network, unfettered access, rotating around, circulating around, being promoted by them, you, you can't, you know, Facebook's response to this fake information is, well, we're going to put a small label at the bottom right hand corner, say this, there's more information about this. And if you want, you can click on this link. You and I both know that's not the way the internet works. That's not the way human mm -hmm. humans work. And so I worry about the underlying mechanism even for correcting the record. And that, you know, that is very worrisome to me. Now, in other places, like when we work on national security um, cases, or we are in the courtroom, or the Associated Press or Reuters are trying to figure out if they should publish a story, then getting it right really matters and we can have an impact. But on social media, it's much, much more difficult. Is there a way of, of knowing in the uh, construction of a video, in the layers of a video, mm -hmm. that it has been manipulated from its original source? Yeah. Yeah. The trick here with detection is that on YouTube today, there are some 500 hours of video uploaded every minute. On Facebook, there's over a billion posts a day. That's insane. And so when you talk about detection, you have to ask at what scale? So there are very good detection at the one-off scale. So a video of a uh, President Trump, a Vice President Biden, uh, Kamala Harris comes out, we've got hours, days to, to analyze it. Yes, we can do really, really cool things. But can I do that at the tune of 500 hours of video a minute? No, it's the scale that's the problem here. And also that the technology for creating deep fakes changes every few months. And so we are, it's, it's like anything in the cybersecurity space, which you know uh, quite a bit about, is that it's a constantly moving target. So what worries me is not the one-off videos where we have hours, days, weeks to figure it out. It's the sheer volume of content that is being uploaded to social media. And we aren't even close to being able to detect at that scale. And so what that means, of course, is that the burden is going to be on you, the consumer, to become more discerning on what you see, hear, and read online. But on a one-on-one -on -one basis, so let's say if you were given a video to analyze and you had uh, the whole time in the world to do so, are there telltale signs in deep fake videos that can be detected? Good. So let's talk about some of them. And, and let me say here, by the way, that there's there's an interesting tension in this question. Yeah. So I'm in the I'm in the forensics business. I'm in the business of developing technology to detect manipulated content. And the tension here is that when I tell you how I do things, well, then my adversary simply can learn. Yeah. So if I'm writing a spam filter, I don't want to 
publicize that to the world and say, okay, here's exactly what we're doing and here's how it works <laughs> because you just create better spam. And that's a little bit of a tension in, in how we do things. And um, having said that, I, I'll describe some of the techniques that we have developed. My favorite one is one that exploits what we call soft biometrics of individuals. So when people speak, and particularly this works very well for politicians who most of the time when they're speaking, they're looking directly at the camera, they're at a microphone, um, they're at a podium, and they're engaging with their electorate or with a reporter. And when we talk, we have mannerisms, uh, the way we raise an eyebrow when we emphasize a word, um, the way we lean forward a little bit, uh, the way we frown, the facial expression we make when we, we say certain words. My favorite example of this is former President Obama, who when, when he delivered bad news, so when he got serious and his, his, he lost his smile, he would tend to tilt his head downward a little bit. It was this really interesting tell that he had, behavioral mannerisms, we call them. And everybody has them, um, and they're actually pretty consistent. And so one of the things we do for uh, people where we can, gen we can gather a lot of video, politicians, CEOs, is we learn in the computer sense what these mannerisms are. And then when somebody creates a puppet master deep fake or a face swap deep fake, underneath it, what's the issue there? It's not the person. It's somebody else is doing all of the movements and facial expressions. And so we go after that, what we call soft biometric. And we say it's soft because it doesn't distinguish you from 7 billion people in the world, but it distinguishes you from an impersonator. And what I like about that technique is that even if I tell you what we're doing, the current deep fake synthesis technologies can't correct for them because they don't have a notion of time yet. <laughs> that is, they synthesize one frame at a time, whereas we look at many, many frames together. What I don't like about the technique is that it only works for famous people, for people who I can get hours of video. So for somebody like me, it wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, for the average person who is a victim, say, of non-consensual pornography, it wouldn't be very helpful. But for a presidential candidate, a prime minister, a CEO, it's, it's useful. When do you think we are going to see these deep fakes in the wild? And what I mean by that is actually be coming across them on a regular basis. We're coming up to an election. So it's a very, yeah. very important election. There's a lot of heat on it. Are you worried about deep fakes making an appearance? Yeah. So I would say we are already seeing deep fakes in the wild. Uh, in the non consensual pornography space, they are everywhere. Um, and so we've already seen them, but not obviously in the political or misinformation space. I would also argue for images, we have seen them in the wild for the purposes of creating fraudulent accounts. So the, the cat is out of the bag a little bit. We are seeing these things enter into the real world. Now, specifically around elections and misinformations of specific people like candidates for high office, I'm honestly not that worried for this election, but not for a good reason, for a really bad reason, which is that just good old fashioned misinformation seems to be working. Just somebody tweeting, writing an article saying X, Y, Z seems to work. And so if you can just simply say something is not true or something is true, and that seems to move thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, why go to the trouble of creating a deep fake? It's, it's not even worth it. Right. And so I think it's so easy right now to manipulate people with just good old fashioned fake information and bots on Twitter that we're not seeing this yet. Now, is it event? Is it coming down the line? Almost oh, certainly. Is it going to be two years, four years? I, I don't know. But I think what's going to happen is at some point, um, the good old fashioned misinformation will stop being as effective. And then those determined to manipulate elections or sow civil unrest or try to destabilize countries are going to start to move in that direction. But honestly, there are so many other problems right now. I mean, that, you know, these, these are, while these do worry me, I'm worried about a lot of other things as well. Professor, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much uh, for giving us your time. Um, Tom, the part I found particularly interesting was that when the professor said that the difficulty is in, in, in chasing after the misinformation once it's out in the wild. Uh, at full fact, how conscious are you of how quickly you have to act once you see a piece of misinformation start doing the rounds on social media and traveling all around the world? Yeah, I mean, this is a long standing problem is, you know, like sort of trying to get a false rumor 
uh, under control once it's out there. It's, you know, it's like trying to get toothpaste back in the tube. But it is important to say that that's something that we actively work on at Fulfax. So actively intervening and kind of chasing these things down and like asking, you know, media outlets to make corrections if they've misreported things, you know, sort of working uh, in partnership with Facebook to try and, you know, make sure that false information on that platform has warning messages attached to it so you can read our fact checks. And so that's a lot of what we try and do is that business of trying to just get a, at least some of that toothpaste back into the tube. <laughs> now, look, we also spoke to Arik Chowdhury, who was part of technology think tank Future Advocacy, when they released deep fakes of Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson endorsing one another before the 2019 election as a warning of how convincing deep fakes can be. But of course, we've not seen any deep fakes used for disinformation purposes in the UK. So was he needlessly worrying people with the stunt? We asked him that. Yeah, there is a balance to be struck between not undermining trust in video content today, but also warning individuals about the future of disinformation and how urgent the need for action is. I would definitely find myself sounding the alarm on deep fakes. Deep fakes will change the nature of online media, regardless of whether I sound the alarm. So we need to be thinking about this today. We still have a few years. If there's one lesson to be learned from the so-called fake news crisis over the last four or five years, is that there is a need to act much earlier on. So although we haven't seen the technology's impacts on democracy in the UK, Arik told us that it is already being employed elsewhere. There's an example of deepfakes already being used to intimidate journalists. There's an example in India of a female journalist who was subjected to a deepfake pornography attack, which was aimed at silencing her from critiquing, uh, I think, the government of India at the time. And it had the effect of her self-censoring herself on social media. So we're already seeing examples of where deep fakes, which don't have to be very good, by the way, they can be very crude deep fakes and still have an impact, but ways in which they are used to undermine democracy. But beyond nefarious political reasons, how do people benefit from creating deep fakes? Arik told us it all boils down to one thing. Money. One of the big drivers of deep fakes generally is the pornographic, and one of the drivers of those is the economics of pornography. These deep fakes uh, generate advertising revenue and incentivize producers to create them, but also to continue perfecting them as well. Better quality deep fakes, more views, more money. Uh, so we need an economic answer as well. How do we change the economics of online advertising? And then, yeah, like you said, we need a, you know, a citizen response. We need people to be equipped to be able to understand that like we are doing currently with fake news websites and equipping people to question what they read online. Maybe in the future we're going to need to train people to question what they watch online as well. It's going to have to be all of those solutions put together and then maybe we can have some hope of this uh, not becoming a problem in the future. So Tom, to wrap up, how concerned are you at Full Fact about deep fakes? Right now, not hugely concerned, but there is definitely scope for that concern to rapidly increase in the future. And so, as with many things, we just need to keep a watchful eye out for it. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to our guests, Dr. Hani Farid and Arik Chowdhury. And of course, thank you for listening to the Full Fact podcast. Now, this episode was released on the 5th of October 2020, so if you're listening to us in the future, please do bear in mind that deepfake technology may have advanced a little since this was recorded. Uh, Dr. Hani Farid and Arik Chowdhury are experts in their field, but their views are not necessarily a reflection of full facts. Full fact is independent and impartial, and you can read more about our commitment to neutrality at fullfact.org forward slash about. As a fact-checking charity, we depend on your support to call out false and harmful information. If you enjoyed this episode, become a supporter today at fullfact.org donate.